Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Nutanix, Influx Data, and DataVail. I'm Stephen Fagg, Director of Database Trends and Applications in Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's podcast. Our presentation today is titled, The Evolution of the DBA, Changes, Challenges, and Opportunities. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response. Plus, all viewers today will be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Now, to introduce our speakers for today, we have Krishna Kappa, Senior Solutions Architect at Nutanix, Peter Albert, Chief Information Security Officer at Influx Data, and Srinivasa Krishna, Global Practice Lead and Director, MySQL Services at DataVail. Now I'm going to pass the event over to Krishna. Hey, thanks, Stephen. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Krishna Kappa. Uh, I work for Nutanix as a Senior Solutions Architect, uh, supporting uh, some of the business critical applications along with uh, the database as a service offering uh, from Nutanix called ERA. So uh, in today's session, we'll talk about the evolution of the DBA, uh, the challenges, the opportunities, and all. Uh, before that, I just want to int introduce myself. Uh, again, uh, I have around 16 years of experience as an Oracle DBA, as a systems architect, uh, and also as a solutions architect, providing end-to-end -end database solutions for customers. So in my current role, um, I help customers to modernize their databases on Nutanix Enterprise Cloud Platform. We'll talk about how to reduce their uh, operational expenses, uh, reduce some of the software licensing costs. So with that, I'll move into the today's session, uh, the evolution of the DBA. So, so yeah, uh, I just want to start with uh, the database world is changing. Uh, as we all know that uh, if you look at 10 to 15 years back, uh, database administrators used to handle maybe one or two databases where uh, some of the critical ones being Oracle, SQL Server, or a DB2, or a Sybase. Those are uh, dedicated database administrators for each uh, relational database. And then uh, they used to I mean, maintain the databases, run it, maintain, and all that. But now, if you look at today, uh, the last few years, it's been the evolution of many uh, open source databases. There are quite a few NoSQL databases. The business requirements have been changing. They want to, uh, the business wants to be much more uh, agile. They want to release applications faster. There are, there are multiple uh, avenues where uh, organizations are looking at. So with that, uh, again, uh, the DBA role has been continuously evolved. Uh, if you look at few years back, as I said, uh, multiple relational databases in the market, every DBA has to manage, operate, and maintain uh, multiple databases, right? And also, if you look at few years back, uh, it used to be only on-prem, where your databases are running uh, on-prem, uh, if a customer can build a private cloud, but it's all within uh, your data centers, customer data centers, right? But now with the adoption of cloud, uh, some of the challenges uh, with the on-prem uh, ecosystem is there are multiple teams, multiple stakeholders. Uh, some of the complexities involving managing data is being is being uh, the key bottleneck. So with that, with the advent of cloud, most of the customers want to uh, want to be much more agile. They want to uh, simplify their database operations. They want to make sure they they are able to provision databases faster, provide uh, a, a service where if you click a, a request, you will you will get either a database as a service or uh, infrastructure as a service, right, uh, or a platform as a service. So with this cloud adoption, customers wants to, organizations in fact want to go faster, they want to release their applications faster. So there are a huge push for uh, cloud adoption. That's naturally, again, based on the business requirements. Uh, if you want to leverage some of the cloud native applications, yes, that's a great uh, avenue too. And uh, overall, if you look at the software life cycle, uh, it used to be a waterfall, and then it moved to agile. And now with the DevOps, 
where uh, the database administrators, the administrators have to work with the developers to make sure they release applications faster. They, they want to release deploy changes faster between environments and uh, deploy changes to the production faster to, 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 go, or to go to the market faster. So all these, uh, again, uh, some of the customers want a self-service approach. There should not be any manual processes. So those should be avoided. So this slide talks about some of these past and the present challenges and how DBA should evolve with all these uh, uh, new, new technologies coming in. So also, if I uh, dig a little deeper, uh, if you look at the traditional database administrator responsibilities, uh, I've been worked as a DBA for 15 plus years where uh, right from uh, provisioning, be it as a single instance or a cluster database, uh, and, and definitely, you know, uh, as, as the audience, uh, you know, the complexities involving around uh, creating complex databases, right? And also how to maintain those. Once the database is provisioned, you have to patch those, you have to perform the entire lifecycle management of that aspect. So that's one. And then how do you perform the backup and recovery uh, aspect of that? How do you manage the upgrades, migrations, all that? So all this is constituting a lot of DBA time, so which leaves very less time for the DBA to concentrate or, or look at uh, some of the business critical aspects, but rather they have been tied up with, with these uh, traditional um, problems actually. So in order to, again, if I dig a little deeper, again, a, a traditional database provisioning involves multiple handshakes, right, right from uh, a request being uh, sent, it has to be approved, someone has to configure the network, uh, all this, right? Uh, you assign database, uh, you create the database, and then you have to set up the SLAs, maintaining, how about the high availability, all that. So that constitutes, again, one of the bottleneck. Similarly, if I look at, uh, uh, again, multiple database engines with different sizes, SLAs, complexities, how do you maintain, run and maintain these databases, right? So that's some of the key uh, aspects where uh, the, the primarily bottleneck around databases are, are these uh, handshakes between, uh, enterprise, uh, between the administrators and, th and things like that. So what customers are looking at? So customers are looking for a solution around database as a service. So that solution can be anything, either you can set up on-prem or you can go to a managed service offering like uh, AWS RDS or, a, uh, or an Azure uh, SQL sort of a service offering. Uh, that's, one way of to, uh, that's one way of doing things. But again, uh, what is that it is required for the business? Uh, some, some organizations cannot move their databases to the cloud due to some of the regulations and all that. So it is, so again, customers are looking for a solution to, to address these traditional challenges. So with that, uh, if I look at it, uh, what customers are looking is a simplified uh, an approach where they, uh, a solution should be scalable, it has to be elastic, it, it should provide all the ingredients to be able to provide high availability, security, uh, performance, everything, right? So, which means uh, the the traditional uh, the, the the traditional operations like the provisioning time should should be cut down. If you look at this chart, uh, the operations which we have discussed have been trimmed down, where it gives enough time for the DBS to look at different different projects, right? Uh, look at different uh, technologies, things like that. So, again, reducing that provisioning, copy data management, or data database refresh operations patching, cloning, so those are the things which, which needs to be addressed. So what Nutanix uh, as a database as a service uh, offering is to provide uh, that simplicity by providing uh, one-click uh, provisioning capabilities, like even if it's a single node uh, Oracle or a SQL server, or if you're looking for an Oracle rack or an availability groups, or in, in fact, the Postgres clusters, so uh, providing a capability where it provides you uh, a simplified way of doing end-to-end -end operations, right from a VM deployment, right to the database deployment, the configuration, and then uh, maintaining those, uh, controlling all the lifecycle management aspects of it is required. So that's something what uh, we provide uh, with the one-click provisioning. 
database production. Uh, we can perform uh, backups within a matter of minutes. Uh, again, even on a multi-terabyte database, uh, the ability to perform backups, how to constantly clone a database in minutes rather than waiting for days for the administrators to copy data between, between networks. So all those aspects is, is something what needs to be addressed. So just to summarize, irrespective of what solution uh, you implement, the database complexities needs to be solved for the DBA to evolve, focus more on the business-driven requirements, and to bridge the gap between the business requirements and to the go-to-market implementation strategies. So with that, uh, I summarize as uh, I see a great opportunity for DBAs to evolve into greater roles like strategic advisors, business drivers, and even cloud evangelists. With that, I will turn it back to Stephen. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker today, Peter Albert, Chief Information Security Officer at Influx Data. Thank you, Stephen. As you mentioned, I'm Peter. I'm the CISO here. You might ask why is a CISO at a DBA conference, but I work at a database company and I started my career as a DBA and spent many years thereafter working with and in teams of DBAs and evolving with the security industry at the same time. And as you all know, I mean, when we talk about cybersecurity, we're really talking about protecting information assets and where do they live? The database. When asked how the role of DBA has changed, uh, I started my career 25 to 35 years ago, depending upon who you ask. One thing that's changed is all these different databases now, specialized databases, one of which InfluxDB, where I work. So where it used to really just be the relational database management system, like Oracle, DB2, Sybase, Informix, now there's all sorts of things. Um, you know, graph databases, log databases, NoSQL databases, document databases. So when taking the role of DBA, you know, I always try to boil things down to what's the role, what's the responsibility. One of the things to really understand is what information am I trying to protect and where is it? Um, in some cases for the very large database systems that are still relational, I mean, they're so massive that really the role becomes protecting the container itself, the application, the Oracle database, and not so much the data or the content. So that's another area of differentiation. Certainly all of these different databases now and different data types. In our case, InfluxDB, we really excel at handling high volumes of metrics data. So it's really good for monitoring things. But if you need something else, like a document database or a repository or an event database, you really look for a different solution. So the DBAs now start to have to develop specializations. Are they going to focus on the traditional RDBMS? Or if they're pressed for understanding data flows, are they also going to start to learn about other specialized databases? So the other area I thought of that was really more pertinent to my role is how cybersecurity or security has changed. A couple of changes in the industry have really impacted the security of a database. One's cloud and one's what I'll call digital supply chain. By cloud, you know, the database is exposed now. It used to be in a box in a room, on a server, protected by a network admin, protected by a sysadmin. Now you deploy a database fresh and it's sitting on a public network exposed and you just don't know who's got access to it and whether or not it's secure by default. And so you've really started to got to learn about things like authentication and encryption and other security precautions that are necessary before you start to run it. This applies to us. We have an open source distribution of our database. Some people download it and install it on their cloud instance. And on any given day, I can do a Shodan scan and find something like 20,000 instances running out there. Now, a lot of them are correctly deployed, but a few of them aren't. 
So security really, you know, has been complicated by cloud. Also the digital supply chain component. If you're talking about protecting the information assets themselves, like privacy data, where does that information go? Because you're now integrating many different cloud providers, we just did an inventory recently. We've got over 100 cloud providers in our ecosystem as a, as a business, not just our service, but the business. And so if we're oppressed by, say, GDPR or another privacy regulation about knowing where privacy information lives, we've got to be aware of that ecosystem, that digital supply chain. And so getting back to the role of a DBA, you may play a part in helping identify where certain types of data moves to, because it's no longer just in your one database system. It's everywhere now. The last thing is really the scale of threat introduced by being in the cloud. Before it was in a room with a tight set of access controls, and in many businesses it still is. I mean, there's still traditional enterprises that need that large database in a brick and mortar, in a room. But for those that have their database instances running in the cloud, it's exposed to thousands, if not millions of people. Um, you know, in my profession as a CISO, we're dealing with, with black hats and gray hats all the time. And so we've got to be really careful about that. The scale is much larger than it used to be um, in terms of, you know, threats. So just the attack itself becomes almost a time series challenge. There's so many attacks per unit time. We've started to learn to leverage a time series database and start to look at security events, not as events, but as metrics in order to identify this. So that's really the last area I had to talk about. And with that, I will hand it back to Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce our final speaker today, Srinivasa Krishna, Global Practice Lead and Director at MySQL Services at Datavail. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, hello, everyone. Quick introduction about Datavail. We are the largest provider of managed database services with over 700 customers across the globe. We've been in the database business for over 16 years now. We are advanced tier partners with AWS and helping customers with their cloud journey for roughly over eight years. Quick summary about Datavel services. Uh, we've been delivering solutions in all major database technologies, as you can see in there. The agenda for today, we'll start with some of the challenges, uh, discuss about cloud, focus on the DBA roles, and finally highlight on some of the key functionality. Right, uh, the requirements for managing and running a modern day enterprise application have evolved over the years, especially in the last 10 years or so with the evolution of cloud. And obviously databases are no exception to it. Let's look at some of the challenges uh, that are driving most organizations more towards the cloud. Provisioning of global infrastructure in just a few clicks avoids the delays and ensures speed of deployment. Reduced operational cost and complexity in maintaining and managing the on-prem infrastructure has been challenging for, for quite some time now. The built-in HA options uh, with guaranteed SLAs ensures uh, uh, you know, uh, reliability and provides peace of mind. Ability to scale up and down uh, on demand rapidly as needed provides flexibility with capacity plan. And of course, the security has been a major concern and is the most important piece at each organization at various levels. I hope most of us agree that cloud adoption has been very successful and continue to grow at a rapid scale. Cloud has been one of the most focused areas at each organization, especially in the last couple of years. So it's crucial to understand the cloud ecosystem, all of its components, get familiar with various solutions and across multiple providers. It is promising that these emerging technologies are leading to new ways of accessing and managing the data, but at the same time, is also increasing the complexity specific to the rise of multi-cloud and hybrid cloud approach. 
We have so many options available, starting from infrastructure to platform and database as a service, and now more towards server lab. Microservices obviously is huge. Uh, think of microservices as a way of modernizing your application, right? Basically taking your uh, legacy complex uh, monolithic application and uh, dividing into several smaller independently managed components is, is getting uh, major attention. With microservices, the need for purpose-built databases has increased specifically more towards the open source databases. And we have so many technologies starting from relational, non-relational, in-memory, graph, ledger, and the, the list goes on, right? And there are so many uh, solutions available for the specific database workloads, you know, starting from transactions, analytics, warehousing, even for hybrid workloads. So there's certainly increasing popularity for NoSQL and a columnar data store is something to consider. I'm not sure how many of uh, us are running your production database workloads on containers, but it's certainly getting more attention, specifically with the rise of Docker and the Kubernetes framework. One important thing to consider when you're running your database workloads on containers is to make sure of those uh, stateful sets and of course the persistent database volumes. Right. Uh, DBA roles, uh, we could typically classify them into the classic uh, operational DBA versus the modern cloud DBA. Basically, with the operational DBA, uh, you know, the approaches were with KDLO, keep the lights on approach, and when it comes to the, the modern cloud DBA, more towards architectural and design specific. In today's world, you know, any kind of an outage could be catastrophic. Right, so it's crucial to ensure the DBAs are involved, you know, starting from design, development, and architectural discussion to understand the needs of HA and scalability uh, without compromising on security and performance best practice. Unfortunately, many organizations would still bring in the DBAs uh, at a later time, you know, when the application either goes to the production or even later when they start to see performance issues pop up. With cloud, most organizations are looking for help uh, with their cloud database migration, right? And of course, expanding on modernization concept. We have seen this trend as well. And as most customers are approaching us uh, for performing database health check assessment, you know, performance analysis, and of course, uh, not just with the health migration, but also the post migration support as well. Right. There is often a misconception that when you move to the cloud with these managed database models like platform as a service or database as a service, they don't really need a DBA. Mostly claimed as a self-managed autonomous database. Although uh, to some extent, it does reduce a portion of the operational complexity, but it doesn't necessarily eliminate the need for a skilled DBA. It kind of shifts the focus a bit more towards the business and growth oriented. There's certainly a lot more activities that will still require a skilled DBA to be able to manage your and maintain your databases, right? Uh, think of uh, architectural, I think kind of pretty much covered it, but uh, you know, making sure of defining those SLAs and the best practices and building that gold image standard, right? Platform operations, making sure of the break and fix, uh, regular monitoring support, restore recovery scenarios, uh, and of course, uh, you know, making sure of those new functionalities and enhancements as per the database technology. Application performance, uh, basically like a DevOps DBA role where you collaborate with the dev teams, you know, help them with the schema design, uh, you know, archival strategies and retention policies, change control process and stuff. Of course, security, making sure the databases are set up according to the security standards and your company's uh, you know, information security guidelines and best practices, and making sure those auditing requirements are met and cleaned. Right, and finally, uh, DBA opportunities is something to make sure to align goals with your business and uh, have those goals realigned according to your uh, future career aspects Identify the gaps, make sure uh, get trained and certifications, uh, focus on automation, and of course, definitely master the cloud. Considering partnering with a managed services provider helps enables your teams to shift the focus more from operational management to 
the more strategic and long-term projects. Right? Again, no single solution works for all. Each use case is different. Each environment is different. Uh, just have to make sure, be flexible, and work with the customers to provide those optimal, feasible, and cost-effective solutions. At DataWell, we have seen this trend and noticed these changes, recognized the needs of our customers, adopted to the technology advances, and continue to evolve. That completes the presentation. Uh, back to you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Srinivasa. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to dive into our panel discussion. So let me pull up our first question here, and it's for you. What are the biggest opportunities and challenges facing database administrators today? Hey, Srinivasa, are you still with us? Uh, yes. Hey, sorry. So, obviously, with DataWell, right? I mean, we work as an extension uh, to our client DBA teams. Right? We carry a long and healthy relationship with our customers. So our customers see us as a strategic partner to help with their growth. So we carry these healthy, long relationships and uh, we take part in their uh, you know, strategic solution discussions and architectural discussions. Right? Our databases engineers are you know, specific uh, subject matter experts in their technology and trends. So we, we uh, educate the customer with the latest technology and trends, the roadmaps, understand their business goals, and provide those uh, you know, uh, solutions accordingly on a periodic basis. Not sure if that answers the question, but. Understood. Um, do you think that in general, uh, the operational management side of the equation, taking the pressure off of that to enable um, more strategic projects, that, that's really the crux of the issue for a lot of database administrators right now? Absolutely. So as I said, when, when you have these uh, strategic management uh, you know, long-term relationships, you know, you get to know the in and out of, you know, the roadmaps, the bottlenecks, the trends, and the gaps, right? So you work with the customer accordingly to drive them, you know, act as long, along with maintaining those uh, managed services, driving them more towards those strategic projects and drive them to achieve their goals. Understood. Uh, so if I'm a, a DBA right now and I'm in a kind of more traditional role focused on day-to-day -day operations, um, does it make sense to kind of brush up on some skills uh, in architecture and cloud uh, to kind of become more of that strategic side of things? Mm -hmm. That's right. Understood. Okay, let's move on to our next question. And we're going to start with you, uh, Krishna. There's a big push in the market for organizations to shift to the cloud. Uh, we see marketing everywhere. Are there still examples for DBAs to make the case to stay on-prem? Yep, uh, I think that's a question which I get uh, pretty much every day from customers. Uh, so, I mean, uh, if, we, if we look at why customers are moving into the cloud, I see a few reasons. One is the agility, uh, the, the, the faster you can create services, right? Be it as a infrastructure services, database services, or a platform services, or a software as a service, right? So uh, with the on-prem, there are bottlenecks, right? With multiple stakeholders, multiple teams, uh, old old ways of doing things. So if we can, uh, if we can provide a cloud-like experience on-prem, I think there is a definite case for customers to 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 stay on prem and and leverage all the uh, technological advancements which happened uh, from a scalable architectures or hyper converged solutions what uh, we from Nutanix brings to the table. So yes, I think uh, if we can uh, provide a cloud like experience uh, with uh, a simple uh, uh, simplifying provisioning operations or database management lifecycle operations. So yes, I strongly believe there is still a case. And also with uh, another example being, if a customer has regulations, they cannot move their databases onto the cloud, uh, and then they have to be innovative to provide value to the customers, to their business. So yes, I do see there is quite a bit of opportunity. Understood, Krishna. Peter, I'd like to get your view on this, especially from a security standpoint. We, we hear that pop up with cloud discussions a lot. 
totally. Uh, that's been a discussion point, I think, since cloud became popular. And we've been facing that dilemma for a while. And I totally agree. There's there's always use cases to keep it where you have it. Sometimes you can't move your database to the cloud because it's, you know, a massive relational database management uh, that just wouldn't perform and it would just be a heroic effort to even transfer it. Uh, you can also make the argument that cloud providers have tremendous people and capital to invest in security. So although there's always that initial hesitation, my database is leaving my building, companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Oracle really invest heavily in people. They have very highly trained security professionals, far more than you may be able to invest as an individual small or medium business. Um, obviously, if you're a very large enterprise, you've probably got that same capability. So, yeah, those are kind of my thoughts. And yeah, in terms of the business case, to cloud or not, both both business cases are valid. Depends on, on the context of what you're trying to do. Certainly, a small company trying to get started doesn't have capital to invest in equipment. Start in the cloud. Um, and contemporary technology businesses really all do well in the cloud but maybe a small bank somewhere in the Midwest. I don't, you know, different environments have different people available to help. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. It's also complicated by the current pandemic because now we're all learning to work remotely. So that'll be an interesting trigger to see how the DBA role changes even more. Absolutely. Uh, that's a great point, Peter. Uh, I'm sure there are some changes uh, taking place. It'd be interesting to do a study on that. Um, Srinivasa, what's your take on this? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, as uh, Peter and Krishna rightly mentioned, you know, uh, there are certain challenges that need to be worked out. And of course, uh, uh, you know, depending on the workload, uh, we have to look, go by the case, right? Not all workloads would be benefit uh, from the cloud, right? Uh, that's why you, know, you need to do the PLC to ensure the workloads are suitable for the cloud. And especially, you know, if you're having like, a, you know, low latency workloads and too many moving of data across the regions and all that stuff, it's going to get complicated. And of course, the cost involved in maintaining and, and managing those things, right? So, uh, and rightly said, uh, you know, different use cases for the security and regulation. Absolutely. So in your opinion, um, Srinivasa, do you see the future for a lot of organizations being somewhat of a hybrid model, some things on-prem, some things in the cloud? Exactly. Exactly. Spot on. As I mentioned in one of my slides, so the trend for hybrid cloud is obviously, you know, think of hybrid cloud as a way of extension, you know, of your on-prem infrastructure, and, you know, instead of just complete like mere lift and shift and cut off, you know, Think of hybrid cloud as you're trying to expand all your footprints from on prem infrastructure also to the cloud and continue to grow from there. Understood. Krishna, is that what you see uh, as well at Nutanix? Yep, definitely. Uh, I echo that. Uh, definitely having an extension, uh, having uh, the hybrid cloud model where some applications need to still run on on prem and uh, some requires to take care of the cloud services. So definitely uh, we see the hybrid model where customers adopt both. And uh, to add on to that, uh, some customers are looking to have, uh, not to have a cloud vendor lockism. So which means uh, they want to run the same application either on-prem or in Azure or in AWS or in GCP. So having the same sort of ecosystem uh, where an application can run anywhere without any application portabilities uh, or changes, that is something a customers are looking at today. And definitely hybrid model and multi-clouds is definitely customers uh, are adopting. We see that as well. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question, and this question is for you, Peter, uh, especially. What recommendations can you give DBAs on how to better secure their environments today, especially with the move to cloud and serverless? Yeah, I was giving some thought to that. So, you know, I, thinking back to my career as a DBA, I guess what it really points to is digging into the documentation and education associated with that database on how to install it securely. Um, particularly in the open source uh, world, you know, it, these things aren't secure by default. 
So when you're asked to instantiate a new database, whether it's in the cloud or even if it's on-prem, um, you know, the proliferation of specialty databases, you know, like time series, uh, NoSQL and so forth, there's a lot more, we call it experimentation going on, prototyping, development projects, which DBAs may be asked to be involved in. So when you're involved in that, or you know, spin up a new instance in AWS, for example, you have to spend some extra time to, to specialize on the, data, the, the associated security documentation. You know how to ensure the data is encrypted. Uh, how to sh- you know whether or not it's isolated from other tenants in a cloud environment, and that you know de- depending upon which uh, you know level you've purchased with that cloud provider, you may be in a shared environment, and you know who knows you may have a compliance. Uh, regulation that says you can't live in a shared environment or maybe there's privacy data in there so you have to understand where it is you know how to enable strong authentication and also how to monitor you know once it's up there in the cloud you know you may not be able to just stand up in the instance of oracle enterprise manager on your desktop like the old days you know you've got to work with that cloud provider to determine what optics you have available from a security perspective who's accessed it um, that's, you know, again, one of the journeys I'm on now as a CISO here at a, at a cloud only company, not only do we provide a database, we provide it in the cloud and we are a cloud consumer, um, for our IT. We, we actually don't live on prem. So I, I was thinking earlier about the hybrid question that also depends on the industry. You know, we're a cloud kind of tech company and we literally have no infrastructure, no servers, um, Whereas some some other business models are are going to vary there. Anyways, that was the, both the previous question and this question. Understood. Thanks, Peter. And I do see some questions coming in from attendees. We are going to tackle those. If you have a question or a point that we aren't discussing right now, uh, just uh, hit us up. We're going to try to get to as many as possible after we finish our panel right now. Next question. Srinivasa, with the rise of autonomous databases, are DBAs going away? Do we still need them? That's a, that's a pretty uh, great question that we get to see uh, here a lot. So obviously, uh, you know, you might have seen one of my slides, uh, you know, having those autonomous databases uh, would certainly help to some extent, you know, in, in uh, managing your databases, but it doesn't necessarily eliminate, right? So there are certain aspects that would still require a skilled DBA, more like, you know, data management, making sure the validation plays in place, uh, and you have those, uh, you know, new features and functional enhancements that are needed to be enabled and leveraged within the application according to the database technology that, that you've been using. So, and of course, uh, the ways to modernize, you know, from one database to the other database technologies as the needs uh, changed. So something definitely to consider. Understood. Moving on to our next question. Um, This is for Krishna. Krishna, what skills are becoming must-haves for DBAs today? Uh, Yeah, I think as a DBA myself, uh, there is a a lot of uh, evolution for the DBAs, as I said. Uh, Again, uh, to the current trends, I would see the cloud ecosystem, understanding the cloud ecosystem, uh, building uh, a database as a service models, uh, either on-prem or in the cloud. And uh, one other key thing what I'm observing these days is to uh, for the DBS uh, tightly aligning their database uh, deployments configurations for DevOps, integrating their databases to DevOps. So that's a key thing what I have been seeing. In order to have a successful DevOps implementations, the DBS plays a major role to integrate uh, the database changes, deployment configurations into the developer lifecycle too. And also with the automation, simplifying things by automating end-to-end is what I see. Understood. Thanks, Krishna. Peter, what do you see as far as, uh, you know, big skills for DBAs, maybe particularly in the security space? Yeah, I was almost wondering, you know, when you're kind of earlier in the conversation, someone was alluding to the kind of career path maybe of a DBA and, you know, just sort of similar to mine where I more or less started as a DBA with an interest in, you know, kind of hacking and evolved, you know, 
through a couple of DBA life cycles and then into ultimately a cybersecurity or a security professional. Um, and for a while, this was about, say, 10 years ago or so, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we started to even look for on DBA teams in our recruiting, we were looking for someone with a security focus. And so we started to create this job title called security DBA. Um, and every now and then we'd find someone who that was their area of, of, of interest. So depending upon which database implementation you're running, say it was an Oracle shop, and there's a whole set of Oracle features related to security, like, you know, an audit, auditing and encryption and so forth. Um, or if you're an open source shop running, you know, Postgres or MySQL um, or a, one of the cloud databases, that is, again, an area of study. Um, and knowledge and specialization. Um, and so, yeah, becoming kind of a, a security DBA, I think is, uh, you know, one of the opportunities, one of the career specialties uh, and, you know, both cloud and, and specialization uh, enable that. Understood. And we, we know the security threats aren't, they're, they're not going anywhere. Uh, so there's, there's definitely a demand uh, in that area. Srinivasa, any particular skills that come to mind as being particularly, um, you know, pressing for DBAs today? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, with the cloud, I think the dimensions have changed. Uh, so more focus towards automation and, you know, having the database modernizations, the migration, conversion, and, you know, now I think probably down the lane, the containers is, is continued, uh, certainly picking up. And now we have uh, the, the blockchain and AI is something to watch out for. Understood. Understood. I'm going to move to our last uh, panel question today, and then we're going to dive into questions from the attendees. So, um, Srinivasa, why don't we start with you? How can DBAs help their organizations achieve the promises of cloud, such as cost reduction, agility, and flexibility? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, with cloud, I think that the most uh, challenging issue would be, you know, uh, initially you migrate to the cloud, everything is running fine, that's good, but as long as you don't manage it properly, you're going to see the increase in cost. So you have to make sure that your databases and the instances or in resources specifically are uh, maintained and contained according to the use uh, to keep those cost uh, uh, optimal. And of course, uh, Provide certainly flexibility with uh, you know the scalability options as you have uh, auto scaling and all that stuff uh, to meet your on-demand scaling requirements as your business grows. And uh, agility, of course, with speed of deployment, you know where you have now provisioning of both uh, infrastructure, database, and code, uh, certainly helps with uh, you know your resources focusing more on productivity versus uh, you know the delays associated with the on-premise or resources. Thanks, Srinivasa. Krishna, what are your views on this? Uh, I think I echo Srinivasa uh, comments uh, in terms of the agility. Uh, I mean, f first, if you are looking, there are two ways, right? Uh, one, if you are looking from a cloud perspective, definitely cost op optimization, making sure uh, uh, the, resource, uh, the resources are being rightly used, uh, tightly uh, controlled is one. Uh, and then if you're looking for an on-prem sort of a thing, uh, identifying uh, identifying the current bottlenecks and adopting solutions that can build uh, a database as a service offering on-prem is, is the key. Understood. And, you know, we hear a lot of education around migrations and how to kind of get through day one. It sounds like that's just the beginning. Uh, it has to be an ongoing process. Absolutely. Okay, at this point in time, we're going to start addressing viewer questions. And uh, this first question actually came up uh, right towards the beginning of uh, our panel discussion. What are the benefits of containerizing databases? And Krishna, why don't we start with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is definite, just like how uh, VMware took over the bare metal uh, instances and moved to uh, VMs. I see a trend where VMs are being converted to uh, containers where uh, you don't need uh, the underlying stack 
to deploy. So everything is simplified uh, where you just run the code. You can, you can spin up a container with, with a particular service and you can offer uh, the service to the customers. Uh, I see a lot of databases being containerized. Again, uh, I haven't seen more of a production wise, but definitely from non prod test, uh, I have seen uh, databases being uh, containerized for NoSQL databases or uh, open source databases to to, read, uh, to to fit some of the use cases. But yes, I see definitely that's being uh, becoming a trend. Understood. And Srinivas, is that what you're seeing too at uh, Databail? Uh, absolutely. Like I said, uh, you know, uh, the containerization of your production databases is probably continue to grow. Uh, as uh, you know, Krishna rightly mentioned, uh, you know, there's definitely increasing popularity with uh, lower environments. But one key aspect to consider, you know, is uh, you know, obviously, it certainly provides some kind of uh, you know scalability to easily scale as as needed, for, and of course, main, maintains the uh, you know the operational continuity. At the same time, uh, when you're running your databases and containers, the most important factor to consider is uh, does your database technology have the capability to manage those underlying uh, auto failover and scalability uh, uh, options built into them, right? And of course, uh, making sure the pods are resilient uh, to testing and failures. Understood, no, absolutely. Peter, why don't we move to you? A uh, question for you: What solutions does InfluxDB have for security monitoring? Uh, yeah, actually, I was just <clears throat> answering that in the box. But we—that that was really one of the reasons I came to work at InfluxDB as a CISO was the opportunity to, to, as they say, drink from your own champagne glass or, or eat your own dog food, more colloquially. Um, Seeing that the, the the security monitoring space had had evolved to being you know in the time series domain as we discussed where you can you can and also cloud where there's data and application out there that you have to protect uh, as a as a security professional for your business so gaining visibility into those. Um, is really a time series domain issue. It's happening so many times. There's so many authentication attempts that are happening, so many failed authentication attempts. Um, so we started to build some tools on our own uh, InfluxDB stack um, uh, and also leverage our cloud. There's a cloud, you can get the cloud version of InfluxDB2 at uh, the, the latest and greatest is cloud2.influxdata.com. And that's where we're running it. And what we're doing is we're starting to collect. Uh, well, the first uh, thing that we've produced that's available for anyone to consume is, is called a template. It's a way people can easily deploy an InfluxDB app and start monitoring something, um, say monitoring a website. And we wanted to look at the security characteristics of that website, like is it available? Um, is it uh, running encryption properly? Is SSL up to date? Is authentication enabled? Because even though you've deployed it by default, Later on, due to a, a fresh deployment or a change, particularly in the whole continuous deployment uh, environment, one of those security controls may have regressed, and then suddenly your database or your app is open. So what this security template using the Influx Cloud Stack does is it checks your instance, your endpoint, we call endpoint security state template, um, at whatever frequency you want. It could be every 15 minutes, it could be every hour, um, it could be once a day. And it, it records that over time, and then it looks for changes. Hey, it looks like authentication is no longer working. Something may have happened, and that can kick off a workflow, so you can go remedy that. Um, so that's the first app that we've created that's available. It's, it's available on our uh, Influx Data template website. Um, and you can also get a free tier Influx database account at Cloud2 if you want to try to build your own. There, there's kind of a rich... Uh, programming and query language available called Flux that enables, you know, queries. So we're looking to expand uh, templates uh, for security monitoring and, and start to start to really get into the SIM space, security incident and event monitoring, given the time series nature. Uh, Understood. Srinivasa. This next question is for you. In what ways do you work and provide support to client DBAs to bring their skills up to speed? 
Uh, absolutely, that's a good question. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we maintain a strategic relation with our customers, right? I mean, the customer uh, TBAs would see us as an extension of their team. So the average uh, customer retention that we maintain at DataRail is roughly around uh, seven years. So we travel with the customer in their journey for quite some time. So uh, again, uh, we, we understand their uh, roadmaps, their bottlenecks, their gaps, and uh, you know, try to provide, uh, you know, meet with their strategic uh, partnership teams and uh, technology teams, and of course, their architectural teams, uh, meet their understandings on requirements and then provide uh, uh, technology advancements and solutions according to their needs. Uh, our DBAs are you know, uh, not shared. We have specific technology experts in their specific domains and they keep up to date with the technology trends respective of their uh, databases. Understood. Krishna, our next question is for you. How can yeah. Nutanix provide databases as service capabilities to customers? Uh, yeah, so uh, Nutanix provides a database as a service called ERA, which which automates uh, the, the four pillars, what we say is uh, provisioning. We automate uh, the end-to-end -end deployment of uh, virtual machines, databases with all the right ingredients, with all the best practices included. Uh, that's one, uh, the provisioning aspect. So we support multiple databases, Oracle SQL Server, MySQL Maria, we have SAP HANA coming up. So a lot of, we have been adding databases to our, our ecosystem. So with that, uh, the, the, the first thing is either if, we, if customer wants to uh, provision a single node or a cluster databases, uh, the, the database as a service uh, provides that. And then the copy data management. Uh, if there is a, uh, a terabyte of production database and uh, if the lower environments require, uh, 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 let's say, a couple of clones for a dev test use case, then uh, the the product called ERA will be able to provision or clone databases within a matter of minutes. So we we'll leverage the snapshotting technology at the back end with application consistent backups, and we'll be able to spin up virtual uh, copies. And then the, the third one is the data protection piece, uh, where we'll be able to perform backups uh, for multiple multi-terabyte databases within a matter of minutes. Uh, these are application consistent. And then the last one is the patching aspect, the complete lifecycle management, uh, right from provisioning, uh, right from patching a grid infrastructure or a Oracle rack databases, uh, as well as SQL Server patching. So those are the key pillars for for the Nutanix databases service offering. Understood. We have a few minutes left before the top of the hour. So at this point in time, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to just leave one last piece of advice to, to the DBAs in the audience today that are dealing with new changes, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, what, should they, what would you like them to really walk away keeping in mind? And Peter, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think the, you know, the, there's a learning opportunity uh, and also a career opportunity you know, seen through, the, through my lens uh, in, in security, uh, but either as a security DBA, I think that that's a, a job title that, that should start to manifest and continue to persist at, at uh, you know, more traditional businesses. And then also, you know, even from in terms of the cloud perspective, um, understanding security monitoring, um, you know, working with security teams, uh, and then also the, you know, secure, whether, the, whether what you're being asked to deploy and manage is secure by default. So just bringing that up, understanding it, understanding the documentation associated with the database, um, best practices, and so forth. Uh, yeah. Understood. Thanks, Peter. Krishna, your uh, your final remarks. Uh, yeah. I mean, as a DBA, uh, there are too many things to learn. Definitely, I get that. But uh, I would say there is a great opportunity for DBAs to to explore a wall. Into, into strategic advisors. Uh, again, that can be different routes. You can, if you are good at automation or interested in automation, you can concentrate on the automation piece. Again, that automation can be leveraged anywhere. Similarly, if you are into a cloud uh, path, I would say concentrate on the cloud path where, uh, again, the cloud, the hybrid cloud, the on-prem private clouds will remain. So a complete understanding of the infrastructure piece and the deployments will be handy. 
And as a third path, I would say DevOps or uncontainerization, as uh, Shani mentioned. Uh, having this DevOps, integrating databases to DevOps, again, piece of automation there, and then uh, containerizing the application stack and the databases. Uh, so these are some of the paths I would see as an opportunity for DBS to evolve. Again, everyone cannot be uh, cannot do everything, but uh, just that given the opportunity where you are, if you can concentrate on each of these, it will be a great value for your careers. Understood. And uh, Srinivasa, your final thoughts? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, a cloud is here to stay, and so are the DBAs. And so it just kind of uh, you know, uh, shifts the focus a bit more towards uh, on the strategic approach here. So I'd say, you know, keep up uh, with the technology and trends, uh, more open source databases. And now I think we have a, a relational, non-relational, I think it's a probably distributed SQL uh, is probably going to go. And of course, country relation uh, is something to definitely consider. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, having those uh, goals realigned um, your company strategic approach and making sure of your personal career choice options and automation is definitely gonna gonna uh, lead the way. I I would agree. I think especially uh, in our current environment, we're gonna see a lot more automation. Well, I would like to thank our speakers today: Krishna Kappa, Senior Solutions Architect at Nutanix; Peter Albert, CISO at Influx Data; and Srinivasa Krishna, Global Practice Lead and Director of MySQL Services at DataVail. If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, please use the same URL that you used for today's live event. It will be archived and we will send you an email once the archive is posted. And again, just for participating in today's event, you could win this $100 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced tomorrow, July 31st. If you are the lucky viewer, we will notify you by email. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon.